Let's go! Lob a tennis ball on one of the few grass tennis courts in the U.S. In the western part of the state, see all things Danish, from history to smorgasbord. Take in a live performance at Iowa's oldest professional opera company. Get revved up at vintage motorcycle races in Davenport and take a close-up look at these two-wheel wonders at an Anamosa Motorcycle Museum. Join me, Dan Karcher, as I travel the state to bring you these stories next on Iowa's Simple Pleasures. Funding for this program has been provided by Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. And by Travel Iowa. Historic and contemporary Norwegian art come to life at the Vesterheim Norwegian American Museum in Decora, while Pella offers a taste of Holland with America's tallest working windmill and Dutch letters. More information is available at TravelIowa.com. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. What do you build on a former cattle feedlot? Why, a grass tennis court, of course. Like many Iowa farmers, Mark Kewen's day begins with chores. There's mowing, rolling the grounds, and applying painted stripes. Okay, this is a working farm, but by now you can tell this isn't a typical to-do list. With advice from Iowa State University turf specialist Mark, a former state legislator, brought one of his passions to life. In 2002, he built a grass tennis court where his family's cattle feedlot once stood. It wasn't easy. The soil here grows corn very well, but it doesn't grow bent grass. We hauled in a lot of very sandy soil and put it on top of the feedlot and then leveled it off, uh, installed drainage lines, tile, about every 12 feet. There are five tile lines that drain the court. We put in a sprinkler system and uh, leveled it off and seeded it. How did you develop your passion for tennis and Wimbledon-style lawn tennis in particular? Well, uh, lawn tennis was my first introduction to the game, listening on the BBC with my grandfather. And so I had an early idea of what it was about. In 2012, Mark and his wife got to see the famed British landmark firsthand. After receiving three rejection letters, he was accepted as a grounds crew intern at the All England Lawn Tennis Club just prior to the Wimbledon Tennis Championships. While there, he met a few of the players during their practice sessions. He also was introduced to Rufus, the hawk that patrols center court to keep the pigeons at bay. He says much of the court care he learned in England will be applied to improve his own court. Still, thanks to Mark, we can get the Wimbledon experience here in Iowa. The Union Jack flag flies, and the court is even named after the All England Club. He says he built this court for himself and friends. But guests, who are required to make reservations at this private court, have come from 36 states and a couple of foreign countries to play on one of the few grass courts in America. Some even fly into the airport in Charles City. Thank you. You guys look the part here. Oh, yeah. We're all yeah. There, this foursome flew in from the Quad Cities, all dressed in the traditional white clothing required at Wimbledon. After posing for the camera, they were whisked off to the farm and wasted no time in getting on the grass court. I started playing tennis uh, the year I went into high school, probably, what, 60-some years ago. 10 or 11 years ago, I was voted into the Iowa Tennis Hall of Fame also. I've always wanted to play on a grass court, never have, and it's it's great. I enjoyed very much. 
first time on grass, and um, it, it's really um, it's really different. You got to move your feet, similar to clay. It's it's got a lot of class and ambiance that uh, is a pleasant surprise. The detail from the fences to the grass to the just the uh, warm hospitality is really uh, really cool. This is like a tennis player's field of dreams. Uh, it's right out here in the in between the, the cornfields and a uh, grass court. Couldn't be better. It's, it's uh, few and far between when we ever get to play on a grass court. The players spent several hours here and took frequent breaks during this hot summer day. That one, there you go. During one of their breaks, I asked Mark to give me a few pointers about playing on a grass court. Of course, we both change into our whites, which I hope will help my game. If I look the part, maybe I'll play better. It's a softer surface, and the balls stay low. They don't bounce as high, and, uh, but from a player's perspective, it's uh, comforting. Uh, it's very easy on the legs. Uh, it, uh, it, you can play here longer, I think. The, uh, the sun's heat is kind of absorbed by the grass. It isn't reflected back at you like it would be on a normal hard court. And it's just a joy here. OK, I've chased enough tennis balls for one day. It's time to let the Quad City visitors have the court back. I have just as much fun watching them from the deck, or the Royal Box, as they call it at Wimbledon. Dan, we thought we'd uh, serve a little bit of the Wimbledon tradition treat here. Here's some wow. fresh strawberries and cream. And that is a Wimbledon tradition? Yes, they serve it during the championships. This dessert isn't offered to every visitor, but it is a touch of Wimbledon tradition. Meanwhile, back on the court, Mark's other guests can't seem to get enough games in. It's a nice day, uh, nice little breeze take, take away the big heat, and uh, couldn't be prettier, so we're really thankful for Mark that uh, he let us come up here and play today. If this foursome has the energy and desire after their game, there's a place just a few miles from here to go cool off. Charles City offers up Iowa's first whitewater course, built on the Cedar River. The city modified an existing low-flow dam and used heavy equipment to bring in large rocks to set the water's flow. Tubers, kayakers, and even experienced canoeists can maneuver around the rocks and through the waves at three distinct whitewater sections of the river but you can choose to bypass the challenge and float the same section on a less turbulent chute on river left. And there is a third choice. If you prefer to just watch the action, there's plenty of green space with some spectator seating at River's Edge. To get a taste of Denmark close to home, just head to Western Iowa and look for an old fashioned wooden windmill. You can't get more Danish in Iowa than Elkhorn and Kimbleton, where there's a mermaid, a menu item called Frikadeller, memorabilia from entertainment legend Victor Borga, and a windmill that stands 60 feet proud. Bill Coleman. I'm here speaking with Lisa Steen Riggs, the general manager of the Danish windmill in Elkhorn. And Lisa, tell me about the history of this wonderful attraction. Well, it is a great attraction. We actually are an authentic Danish windmill from Denmark that was built in 1848. And it came from Nørresneta, Denmark. And it was kind of one man's crazy idea. We ought to have a windmill from Denmark. Tell me, how did they disassemble something and put it back together here in Iowa? Well, it wasn't easy. We, thank goodness for the carpenter in Denmark. As he tore it down, he marked each piece, to, and then he made this model, and it's on a scale of 1 to 10, and put the same markings on the model. So that was our blueprint. It took our people one year. We had over 300 volunteers and a total of $100,000, and it took them one year to rebuild it, and they built it to working condition. After 165 years, this windmill can still grind grain, provided the wind is blowing. Some of the grain, ground into flour, is sold in the adjacent gift shop. I wanted to learn more about the Danish culture and how so many immigrants ended up in this part of Iowa. So no better place to go than the Danish Immigrant Museum. 
tradition has it that some of them got to western Iowa to the boundary uh, with, uh, with the, what was then Indian territory in uh, the late 1840s, 1850s. Uh, then in the 1870s, that's when the, the large migration begins here. John Mark says with the development of steamships, the travel time for Danes coming to the U.S. was cut to 10 days to two weeks. You could take what you could pay for and so that was part of the, the issue as well. But so most of them uh, took uh, maybe a, a, ch a chest, maybe several immigrant chests, and we have a number of those in the exhibit. Uh, and in that chest would of course be, be uh, packed probably mostly uh, uh, textiles, uh, uh, sheets, clothing, that sort of thing. Since it was founded in 1983, the museum has accumulated some 35,000 artifacts, from Danish porcelain to pins from various fraternal organizations. In 1976, the Queen of Denmark gifted what's called a China chair by renowned Danish designer Hans Wigner. Among the more unusual items, cast molds from the short-lived vintage Madsen automobile built by a blacksmith in Council Bluffs. On a musical note, we're told this piano was the very first one ordered by 20th century Danish-American pianist and humorist Victor Borga. However, when we received it, it could not be played. First of all, they found water damage still in the soundboard from Hurricane Hugo. Then to celebrate his, the centennial of his birth in 2009, we had it restored you know, this community has done a great job of preserving history. But some here are also exposing us to modern Danish trends. In several locations around Elkhorn, there are electric car recharging stations. You can go to Copenhagen on the island of Samsu or the island of Aarhus, and you can find electric vehicles there. The windmills brought back from Denmark and what we're doing is trying to bring technologies back from Denmark relating to a variety of renewable energies, and electric car is one of these. We're a little ahead of the curve, but as of the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. So in the future, we'll be having more vehicles coming. Let's see. I've seen Danish technology and history. How about some Danish food? On the highway into Elkhorn is the Danish Inn, known for its smorgasbord. Oh, everything looks great, but I think I'm going to hone in on the Danish specialties in particular. I know red cabbage when I see it. If you are not um, as hungry for the buffet, um, we also have a number of small broad. It's open Danish, Danish open face sandwiches. Um, we have the um, beef with romalade. We also have the fricadilla. The roast pork has the red cabbage over the top of it. We also have our beef with horseradish. This is the Danish cheese uh, Havarti, and we've got a couple of uh, red um, peppers and some radish over the top here as well. Last but certainly not least is our Danish dessert, and this being one of our most popular ones, this is our Danish Kringle. Um, it is a very light, flaky, puff pastry dough um, with a very rich almond cream through the center. Yum. From food, to technology, to history. I've learned a lot about the Danes today, but I want to make just one more stop. A few miles north of Elkhorn, in the town of Kimbleton, is a bronze, full-size replica of the Little Mermaid. Just like the one that reposes in Copenhagen Harbor, one of Denmark's most popular tourist attractions. And to think, I didn't even have to board a plane and travel some 4,300 miles to experience my taste of Denmark. Whether you're a devoted fan or just want to experience your first performance, head to South Central Iowa to hear the sounds of opera music. For a few magical weeks each summer, Des Moines Metro Opera comes to life right here at the Blank Performing Arts Center with world-class performers and productions. Maestro, if you please. Yeah. 
I'm watching part of Don Giovanni by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. From the first note, I'm transported back to 17th century Spain, where the title character, Don Giovanni, disregards the happiness of others to get what he wants in life. Just so you know, I don't understand the Italian being sung. I can tell you a bit about the plot line because I'm reading the English supertitles projected above the stage. Don Giovanni is one of the three operas performed in repertoire during this particular season of the Des Moines Metro Opera, which runs late June through early July. An audience can come to our festival and they can see one opera on Friday, one on Saturday, and another one on Sunday. Uh, this has been a formula that's been very popular with audiences for 40 years because it's user-friendly. The formula works well for those traveling from out of town. This couple, attending the pre-opera Sunday brunch in the theater's lobby, drove in from Chicago. Last year, first time. We saw all three. We came for a long weekend and saw all the performances and we're doing the same thing this season. The quality was the thing that brought us back. We've been to the lyric and also the, the math and stuff. You're a little bit backward. Here you can see their eyes and their facial expression and stuff like that, which is really very special. Performer Michael Mays, who plays Don Giovanni, agrees. I've sung with the Nashville Opera, Michigan Opera Theater, Fort Worth Opera, which is my home company. And you go into this theater, and instead of the, the action happening 60, 80, 100, 200 feet away from you, it's happening three, four feet away from you. The orchestra is in the middle of the stage under the ground. There's not another place in America that's got a stage like that. The orchestra pit may be unique, but it wasn't worry-free for Michael on opening night. When he said a wardrobe malfunction impaired his vision during a sword fight. It was weird, so I get out there and the, the, the mask slides up over my eyes like this. So I'm, I'm doing the sword fight blind. Oh my gosh, completely blind, over a pit, you know? Luckily, he and the other performers had rehearsed enough to get through the entire opera without incident. While the cast and crew prepare for the opera, so does much of the audience. The Des Moines Metro Opera offers audience members a same-day pre-performance class to learn more about the story they'll see. This was a very popular story in Europe at the time. It was a trusty standby at theaters one that they put on when they wanted to attract big audiences. Oh my goodness, it's, it still works, wow. Um. The class can be helpful to beginners like me, but I wasn't the only first timer. And what are you looking forward to? The whole experience, the, the costumes, the singing, um, the, the set, everything. I'm just open to new experience and this is a, a new experience, so I'm excited because I didn't realize that this was going on here even. A lot of people may be surprised to learn that Iowa has an internationally recognized opera company and that its home and performing arts center is in Indianola, population about 15,000. We do auditions every year, 800 auditions live around the United States for performers, both for our main stage and for the Apprentice Artist Program. We have 200 employees or more every season who come to our festival to, to work with us, either as singers, orchestral musicians, uh, craftspeople, technicians, backstage folks, uh, you name it. it. It takes a campus setting to house that many people. Michael says many in the opera are housed in dormitories on the Simpson College campus within walking distance of the theater. And not all hail from out of state. Milford, Iowa native John Moore played Eugene Onegin in Tchaikovsky's opera about a selfish hero who lives to regret his rejection of a young woman's love. His carelessness leads to a fatal duel with his best friend. I came to opera because I had wonderful music training in Iowa high school. Luckily, I had some really wonderful advice as a kid about singing, and I carried that through until now. And now I've been very fortunate to have a, 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 what is amounting to a, a pretty solid uh, beginning of my career. You have a fantastic set of singers at the beginning of their careers, young, elegant singers and actors that actually look the parts. You're Eugene Onegin on Friday night, perfect example. 
you could actually believe that they were late teenage or early 20s. Some of our more famous alums include people like Lauren Flanagan, Hei Kyung Hong, uh, Raimonda Chetto, uh, folks like that who are, are very well known in the opera industry who got their start here in the middle of Iowa as opera singers. Wow, that's an impressive list. Back to what's happening on stage today. I'm anxious to see how our evil leading character gets his due in the end. The pure drama is simply captivating. The golden age of motorcycle road racing spans 50 some years, starting back in the 1930s. The vintage cycles still race in eastern Iowa. What do you get when you combine fearless drivers, some amazing two wheel machines, and a whole lot of noise? It's the annual antique flat track motorcycle race in Davenport. The chief Blackhawk chapter of the Antique Motorcycle Club of America has been racing at Davenport's Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds for well over 20 years. It's held at the same site on the same weekend as a swap meet, where enthusiasts can shop for almost anything motorcycle related. Back on the track, there's several afternoon practice runs and heats to watch. The evening brings 10 main race events where motorcycles are divided by eras from the 1920s up through the 80s. Racing's a lot of fun. Keep it that way. Don't get so serious that you go out and hurt yourself or hurt someone else, you know. I mean, As a race promoter and a racer himself, Matt George stresses safety first to the drivers. It's good advice anytime, but especially when riding some of the vintage models made without brakes. And some of these antique bikes can reach speeds of more than 90 miles per hour. Now, I understand that the motorcycles are authentic. Not all the gear is. The board track bikes, they wore leather helmets and wool vests and leather pants. And that, you know, since we do in this day and age have good safety equipment, we, we make them wear those. Matt says there are typically more than 125 racers who participate in this event. And I found out their backgrounds are as diverse as the motorcycles you see here. You know, I've been watching my dad do this since I was just a little kid, you know, and it's, it's a big part of preserving history. There's one of few places in the country you can come out and see something like this. Guys running 100 year old motorcycles, and, uh, you know, we're uh, definitely here to put on a show for the crowd. Well, this is a 1921 Harley Davidson race bike. Uh, last year on this track, we, uh, my particular bike, the way it was geared, I was running about 71, 72 miles an hour on the straights. I am racing my 1956 165 cc two-stroke Harley Hummer with a rigid frame. The first year I raced here, I ended with fourth, and the second year I raced here, I actually ended up with third. So hopefully I'll be doing pretty good this year. I ride an XL350 and a Yamaha XS650. I understand there's a story behind the decoration on this bike. Tell us about it. Well, when I deployed to Afghanistan in 2009, the bike was just plain white. And I came home on leave in April of 2010. And my friends had tore the bike apart and completely repainted it, redid it. Why do you race a vintage bike instead of a brand new one? Because I'm 70 years old and I love them. Tell us about your bike. That's a 1973 Norton. It's probably the best motorcycle here. And if he had a young rider, he'd probably win everything it went out on, but... How's your hearing? I can't hear a thing. Would you speak up? It is quite a noisy venue for both the riders and the spectators. But the crowd doesn't seem to mind. After all, how often do you have the opportunity to see so many working antiques doing the job for which they were intended? These races are held just once a year in Davenport. But drive about 75 miles north, and you can see hundreds of vintage motorcycles year-round at the National Motorcycle Museum in Anamosa. Our collection is constantly growing. It seems like every week we roll in one or two more bikes, and I think we've cleared 400 total motorcycles, and we have, probably have about 45 or 50 bicycles also. Now, what if you make the trip here to Anamosa, and you just have an hour or two? What's a good strategy for getting the most out of the museum? I would say you need to see the celebrity bikes, uh, the McQueen Indian, the Easy Riders machine, the Evil Knievel jump bike. 
Uh, great collection of Harley Davidsons. The toys are a lot of fun. And check out the bicycles, because that's kind of where a lot of us started our two-wheel adventure. Mark says there are more than a half dozen significant motorcycle museums in the U.S. And it's an unusual story on how Iowa got one of them. This museum was originally established in Sturgis, South Dakota, until an Anamosa motorcycle enthusiast and entrepreneur with a vision got involved. In 2000, uh, they were considering closing the museum. So I took it over to run it initially out there, but uh, it's hard to run a business 800 miles from home. We moved it to Anamosa. You know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. It's a beautiful day for a ride. So, so we rode 200 miles out here to Anamosa to visit the museum. The most amazing thing that I've seen out here had to be some of the drag bikes back over there. First one to go do 250 miles an hour. There's something for everyone with such a wide range of motorcycles and memorabilia on display. In addition to the history of motorcycles, there's also the history of some of the motorcycle clubs. One of the better known motorcycling clubs for women is the Motor Maids. They started about 1940, and I think their club uh, roster numbers about 4,000 members right now. After seeing so many motorcycles here, I can't help but wonder, do any of them still work? Dan, I think if you picked one out at random and gave me about three hours, anywhere from one to three hours, I could get it running for you. They've all got engine internals. We might have to find a battery, do a little bit of service on the fuel system, you know, the fuel tank and carburetor, and I think it'd fire off. Mark may get some of them up and running, but don't ask to ride one. They are, after all, museum pieces, <laughs> darn it. We'll just have to snap a photo of one of our favorites and dream about how nice it would be to take one out for a spin. Want to see video clips from other Iowa gems we visited over the years on Iowa Simple Pleasures? Visit our website at iptv.org slash simplepleasures. Explore where we've been and plan your own Iowa adventure. We visited all the Iowa attractions profiled on this program, but circumstances can sometimes change, so we encourage you to call ahead if you're planning a visit of your own. Funding for this program has been provided by Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. And by Travel Iowa. Historic and contemporary Norwegian art come to life at the Vesterheim Norwegian American Museum in Decorah, while Pella offers a taste of Holland with America's tallest working windmill and Dutch letters. More information is available at traveliowa.com. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.